Welcome to our webinar in honor of the Million Cat Challenge team. I just want to start off with my sparkly ears just because this is a shout out to the awesome Million Cat Challenge team and all of the challengers. If you're new to the Million Cat Challenge, please join us at milliongatchallenge.org. We call our team the challengers and they are just people who said they wanted to say one more cat. So we are happy that you're here. I will take my e flashing ears off soon when we get started so it's not so distracting. But my name is Dr. Sarah Pisano. I'm with the Million Cat Challenge, the University of Florida Shelter Assessment and Mentorship Program, and Team Shelter USA. And we are talking about my second favorite thing, which is adoptions, going home. My first favorite thing is keeping animals out of the shelter. But if you are um, doing adoptions, we're so happy you've joined us. We want you to embrace your community, embrace the animal advocates in your community. Adopters Welcome is the um, greatest guidelines um, put out by the Humane Society of the United States, and the link will be there in the chat. So I want to thank um, Royal Canaan for sponsoring this whole webinar series. This is the fifth and final series of uh, five webinars. So if you missed any of them, please go back. They're all recorded. I want to thank Maddie's for hosting this webinar. And we are going to have a really great talk show today with lots of amazing people um, doing some interesting work and helping us be more efficient and be more confident in the way that we do adoptions. So I am going to ask and welcome April Harris from Adopt a Pets to come Hello. on. Hello, everyone. Go, April, welcome. I will take off my flashing cat ears so that it's not too distracting. That was <laughs> the celebratory ears. But boy, the, this, I'm so excited for everybody to hear about adopt a pet and what's been happening. It's so exciting because I really believe it's going to give people confidence. And we're going to talk about that as you go through your presentation. So tell us how um, the numbers sort of be before COVID. And if you want to share your screen now and show yeah, I think your slides. I think a chart really displays well what's been going on for adopt pets. So, um, you know we've always been trending kind of that we've had the same audience kind of been comes and goes and we have new people coming, but we noticed something pretty um, crazy happening with our numbers this year, uh, specifically related to the pandemic. So in this chart, the uh, blue line is going to be 2019. These are unique website visitors by week. Um, and the orange line is the 2020 numbers. So this graph actually chart, uh, begins on the week of March 10th. You'll notice there's a sharp increase in our site visitors. So the week of March 10th, we see this huge increase. Um, the week of April 20th, it actually peaked out at 100% over previous year's numbers. Um, unbelievable. And unbelievable. And we, uh, the week of April, actually the whole month of April, there were 3 million unique visitors per week, meaning that we had 12 million unique visitors to our website looking at adoptable so, pets. Well, can you see my it's, show? Oh my gosh, it's just amazing. April, you know what I thought? I just noticed somebody was here from Prague. We might have people that don't know about adopt a pet so maybe oh, yeah. we have like an elevator speech. Yeah, so adopt a pet is a search engine for adoptable pets. So we promote pets that are in shelters and rescue organizations. We basically create accounts for them, get them set up with their software for importing um, pets, or they can manually add pets as well. We're a nonprofit organization. We're funded by sponsors like Purina and um, Bayer, which is now Elanco, and Chewy, um, and they basically fund our website. So what we do is we use technology to make sure that when somebody searches to buy a dog, adopt a pet, adopt a kitten, purchase a, a French bulldog, that they actually see your pets first. So we make sure in the search algorithm that adopt a pet shows up and they see your pets first. So we're really just trying to promote the pets that are in shelter. And then we do have another service that I'll talk about on the last slide that is for pet owners looking to rehome their own pets. So that's kind of the elevator pitch of adoptpet.com. Um, 
So, you know, we, we saw this huge increase, but one of the things that we are paying very close attention to, and I think which is really, really important for shelters, rescues, um, it, to understand is that, you know, as of, as of June 1st, we now are seeing a new normal, and that's still 43% higher than it was last year, and that's maintaining. So we have now 2.2 million unique visitors per week compared to 1.5 million last year. Um, and unique visitors, I, I think it's just important, when you look at unique visitors, it might be 6.5 million unique visitors, but for the entire month, it's closer to 10 million visitors, and that's because each month for about 4 million visitors come back the next month and the next month looking for the pet they're looking to adopt. It's really so, incredible. And a shelter recently said, oh, in the beginning of COVID, every, it was so busy. Everybody wanted to adopt and it's not like that anymore. I'm like, I think adopt a yeah. argue with that. So really good for us to know. Thank you. Yes. Do we want to go to the next slide? Is sure. It um, different things that you've noticed within that data. So your um, page detail. Your page. Yes. So, you know, just because somebody comes to our website doesn't mean they're actually looking to adopt. And we know that there are plenty of people who are bored at work and just want to look at cute pets all day long. Or there may be people who aren't, you know, our kids and they just want to view pets because they can't have one yet. Um, so we want to understand adoption intent. And there are two ways that we can actually understand whether or not the person's really interested. The first is the pet detail page views. So you can run a search and see all the pets, but we want to know how many of people are actually clicking into an individual pet to view that pet. And this is on the same timeline. So it begins on March 10th. Um, so we saw that huge spike the week, the week of April 20th, where it was 108% over last year's numbers. And we're still maintaining a 53% increase over last year's numbers. Now, what's even more interesting about these numbers when you look at them compared to the last chart is that you saw that the web, the, the actual visitors are at 43%, but the pet detail page views is 53%. So that means that more visitors are actually showing intent than were previously. Um, and then the next um, way we can know intent is our pet inquiry forms. So when an organization, um, when somebody's interested in a pet at a specific organization, uh, any organization can have this pet inquiry form turned on where we basically collect a bunch of information from the person who's interested and then we send that over to the, the shelter or rescue. And that signals a lot of intent because they're putting in their email address, their name, whether they rent or own, how many pets they have. They're giving us some data. So that tells us they are very, very interested. Once again, um, we saw a 172% increase on April 20th over previous years, and we're maintaining a 70% increase um, of pet inquiry forms being submitted. Now, when you look at the scale of these, I think it's important to notate that the pet detail page views, these are in the millions. So the week of April 20th, there were almost 8 million pet detail page views. Um, we're still maintaining about 5 million every single week. But when you look at pet inquiry forms, you notice the scale goes way down into the thousands. And that's because not every organization has that inquiry form turned on. So we can't collect data on those. If they're asking people just to reach out directly via email or um, directly via uh, telephone, then we wouldn't be able to track that data here. But you know, we can see that there's still a lot of intent. So the people coming to our site are not just looking, they want to adopt. And just anecdotally, um, we are getting a lot more uh, kind of frustrated users, so to speak, because every pet they look at is already adopted, or every pet that they look at has multiple applications. And we also are hearing it from the shelter and rescue side where they're saying, wow, like we're getting way too many inquiries from adopt a pet which is that was going to be a problem right yeah there's definitely kind of a supply and demand uh reversal right now specifically you know in some regions it's it's quite extreme um but we definitely can feel it from the user side too where people are saying it's taking me like i'm forever to adopt whereas last year you could adopt quite quickly right um, which and is not a bad problem Right. And April, I want um, our listeners to be clear that all of these numbers that you're showing, this is dogs and cats, and then you yes. have some other um, information like uh, number of breeds. And I did want you to briefly talk about the dog breed searches because the better dogs do in shelters, the better cats do and vice versa. So even though this is a million cat challenge webinar, we want to talk about what people are searching for, like what kinds of breeds. So tell us about that. 
Yes, yeah, so we analyze everything that everybody does on our site to, to try to understand how we can help them, but also how we can help pets and shelters and rescues. Um, one of the stats that's not included anywhere here, but I'll just tell you right up front, is 75% of the people coming to our site are searching for dogs and 25% are searching for cats. So one out of four are going to be doing a cat search, three out of four are going to be doing a dog search. And there can be a lot of reasons why that's happening. It could be that we're not doing a good enough um, SEO for when people are searching, you know, adopt a kitten. It could be that there are fewer cats on the site. There can be a whole list of reasons why that's happening. But we do pay close attention to what breeds people are searching for. And I think everybody's going to be pretty surprised when you see the top five breeds that are actually searched. Um, so the number one breed searched by people uh, visiting our site is German Shepherd, followed by Labrador Retriever, followed by Chihuahua, followed by American Pitbull Terrier, and then Golden Retriever. So that's right, more people search for pit bulls than Golden Retrievers, which I know it doesn't always feel that way when you're in a shelter, but that's what we know about the people who are visiting. Um, because we have other, go ahead. That to me is just such crucial information because um, pit bulls in so many shelters are overrepresented, right? And we feel yes. defeated by it. But look at this amazing information, number four, and was recently number three and yeah. just recently got bumped by chihuahuas by the famous Chi. Yeah. So really, I think, important information to everybody to know. So because we have the rehome service, we actually are interested in understanding what breeds are getting rehomed. Um, so this shows you the top five breeds that are actually getting rehomed and the breed is selected by the pet owner. So, you know, it's whatever they think their dog is. So Pitbull Terrier appears top of the list, followed by Lab, German Shepherd, Chihuahua, Husky. Um, so, you know, what's good for this is that the kinds of dogs that people are rehoming are actually being searched for. But there's another... There's another piece of data that we have, and it's because we monitor the rehome and we actually process the adoption is we can see pets that are being rehomed, what's actually getting adopted. And the pets that are, the breeds that are getting adopted, labs are number one adopted through rehome, followed by Chihuahua, German Shepherd, American Pit Bull Terriers are number four in there, followed by Huskies. So when somebody needs to rehome a Pitbull Terrier through our site, we know that there's a good chance that it's actually going to get adopted and we'll probably get multiple applications. So some, you know, some things here that might help you feel less pressure when it comes to Pitbulls and even Chihuahuas in some parts of the country because people are searching for them and looking to adopt them. Yeah, amazing. And what about cats or cats next in the... Yeah, so cats, um, Surprise, Maine, Coons. <laughs> Maine Coons, you know, um, followed by Siamese, Bengals, Sphinx, and Ragdolls. I don't think there's any, you know, thing there that's kind of crazy to us. We know everybody wants a big 18 pound Maine Coon cat. Um, when we look at pets, uh, kind of cats that are being rehomed, you get into people are kind of just selecting domestic short hair, American short hair, long hair, medium hair, Siamese falls into that. And then when we look at the adopted numbers, um, this is always good for us to see that, you know, domestic short hairs, American short hairs, they're all, they're all getting adopted, but Maine Coons are getting adopted too. So if somebody's rehoming a Maine Coon, it's going to get adopted. Um, and just one of the things we have noticed um, specifically related to COVID times is our adoption rate for rehomed pets has tripled. So it's gone up 300%. Wow. Um, so we are now seeing bonded pair cats getting applications, multiple applications. Senior, I just saw a 10-year-old cat that was placed in seven days. I saw a 14-year-old cat last month that was placed within 14 days. I saw a pit bull terrier that had behavior issues, um, medical issues. And even though it took some time, that pet was placed within three months. Um, so because there aren't as many pets in shelters and rescues, people are finding them directly out of homes. And so we're able to monitor all of that. And I think it's just really interesting to see what's happening with all of the animals that are out there right now. And it's good news for pets that are getting rehomed directly because they're getting a lot of attention and getting adopted. Exactly. Because like I said, my goal is let, let remember only one out of four animals in the United States in homes right now were adopted at shelters or rescue groups, right? So people are doing this on their own. And um, did you want to talk, did you have another slide about rehome? I can't remember. Rehome. Okay. So yeah. So what rehome is. Too. Yeah. Rehome is fairly new. It was just launched in 2017, but basically what we did with, um, 
the Petco Foundation actually helped promote the service and fund it is we allow pet owners to list their pets on adoptapet.com. Um, so it eliminates Facebook and Craigslist and kind of all those like free to get home posts. So it's completely free for the pet owner to list their pets. Um, they create a profile just like you would for a shelter or rescue pet. We do charge a small adoption fee. It's either 20 or 30 for dogs and or cats and then dogs. It's $49.99 or $129. Um, we're a nonprofit organization, so we're not really trying to make money off this. Uh, we just have a lot of data around free to good home exchanges. And so we have that small adoption fee to help with um, some of the problems that can start there. So we basically give the adoption fee back to any animal welfare organization that referred them. So if you are not referring people to rehome, you need to reach out to me because I I sign off on this month, I signed off on $15,000 of checks that just went out to organizations that had referred pets. Not only is the pet not coming into your shelter or your rescue, but you are also going to collect the adoption fees. So it's, it's pretty much a win-win all the way around. Uh -huh. um, and the last thing that's really important is that our staff actually monitor the profiles and the applications. So we make sure there's no scammers, there's no breeders, there's no people, you know, breeding puppies in their backyard. Uh, we monitor all of those things. We make sure pet owners aren't trying to make money back. So they bought a purebred dog for $1,200. They want their $1,200. That's against our terms. We monitor all of those things and we monitor the applications for, we call them shenanigans as well, just to make sure that we're, we're really helping the population of pets that we can that would otherwise end up in a shelter or rescue. Now, because we have this rehoming service, I think there's been this perception that perhaps more people are rehoming their pets now because of, you know, financial hardship or the economy or because of COVID. So we, of course, are tracking that data as well. Um, and this is from the beginning of the year. So this is all of 2019. So you can see 2019 was always trending up. Um, and so is 2020 at the beginning of the year. And the reason why it's trending up is because of awareness. So more shelters and rescues are referring, more people are finding it through organic searches. But you'll see the week of March 10th, there was a sharp decrease in weekly uh, rehome onboards. Fascinating. Yeah, so, so during its, at the base of it, which was the, the week of April 20th, it was down 33%. And even now, we're just barely trending back up to what 2019 numbers were. Um, we should be much higher just based off like the natural trend line from 2017 to today. So we are not seeing that more people are rehoming their pets right now. Um, we're also tracking reason for rehomes. So we're not seeing any increase in more people rehoming for financial hardship, uh, landlord permission issues, relocation, any of those things. We're not seeing any change in, in the reason for rehome right now. Interesting. And then, so we'll see what happens in the next six months. But April, yep. this information to me is so incredibly helpful for all of us. And we're so grateful to adopt a pet. Thanks so much for sharing. And I think this was your last slide, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much for having us. And Thank if you, you don't know, if you have an account, just reach out and I will get you taken care of. <laughs> yeah. The website's in the chat. April's going to stick around for questions at the end. So stay tuned. And I'm going to ask Jessica Schlater from Adoptimize to join me now. Hello. Hello, Jessica. How are you? I am good. Thank you so much for, ha for joining us today. And were you going to share your screen? Um, not okay. yet. Okay. Okay. So tell me about Adoptimize is fairly new, right? So tell me how Adoptimize sort of started. So uh, we've been around for about a year. Adoptimize is an animal shelter software that automates great intake photos to increase adoption rates. Um, and we've been piloting this uh, across the U.S. in multiple shelters. Uh, we've processed about 8,000 animals to date. And results have been uh, pretty incredible. Basically, what we do is we, uh, we remove the, take the shelter out of your shelter photo. Um, and so I guess I'll run through a couple stats that we've seen. So the city of Stockton up in um, California, taking about 10,000 pets a year. Um, they had their six month numbers come in yesterday and the pets with adoptimized images saw 79% higher adoption rates. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. I, what, what, the, because this is my, this is such a hot topic for me because as you know, and why you started 
Adoptimize is because it's so incredibly difficult to get good pictures, right? When, when animals are stressed and people are stressed. And when we reached out to you, we were so excited to talk to you. You know, we're like, oh, Jessica, can, you know, is there somebody on your staff that can, you know, come do this interview? And then we found out you're it. You're the creator. <laughs> you're, you're a one woman show. Like, we're so impressed with you. It's so incredible, your story. Thank you. So thank you for creating Adoptimize. And the first thing that's on people's minds is, wait a minute, I thought Adoptimize was for dogs and you did start with dogs, right? And the video. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So we started with dogs. Um, basically what we did was we trained an algorithm on thousands of uh, dog pictures to find the best shots. Um, but what we found out is that, you know, dogs can take pretty good photos. It's really hard to get a good photo of a cat. So we've spent the last six months uh, perfecting our cat algorithm. And now, uh, as of last week, we've launched Adoptimize for Cats. Woohoo! Pop the champagne, somebody. <laughs> Five o'clock somewhere. That's so exciting. Because, whew, was that needed, too? I just love it. Um, so you said some stats about, um, was it San Jose you just shared with us? It was Stockton. Stockton. Um, and, yeah, and so we've seen increased adoption rates at all of our municipal animal shelters that we've been in. Um, they've been, it's been at least a 10% increase in adoption rates. But the other thing that we're seeing kind of across the board is that the RTOs are up. Um, so for example, El Paso, um, they process about 27,000 animals a year. Well, I guess that was last year's stats. Who knows what's yeah. going to be this year. Um, but their RTOs are up 26%. And so what that means is that the status quo, people weren't recognizing their pets. And right. so with these, these, basically they're brighter, clearer photos. They're kind of, oh, wow. Um, people pay attention. And, you know, as a result with the increase in RTOs, um, these pets are actually saving the shelter money. So El Paso is actually saving $22 per pet that goes through Adoptimize. Love it. I know. When I was public shelter director, I would like say to my staff, like, look at this pet. The picture is like this. Like, right. I think like the owner's going to know that that's the, right? So right. This, I love this. This information is so incredibly exciting. And, and I think it'll help people um, want to use Adoptimize for sure. Yeah. And, you know, the whole thing about Adoptimize was it actually started as something completely different. It was matching people to pets online based on online behavior. And so it looked a little bit like hyper-targeted AdWords for pets. So like if you were on Facebook and you were signed up for a marathon, you might be a good fit for an active dog. So we'd show you a picture of the local hus of the husky yeah. from the local yeah. shelter. And there were plenty of things wrong with this model, this idea, um, one being breed. Um, but the biggest problem was the pictures that we were going to use. We're going to take them directly from the shelter. But you're right. It was like the cat in the kennel with whale eye, like, <laughs> eh, like that. And I was like, wow, you can't really say, hey, this one's perfect for you. Yeah. Uh, no, one will, no one's going to believe that. <laughs> yeah. So... Oh. Yeah. Well, why don't you give us a tour? Why don't you share your screen and give us a tour of for the cat? Let's talk cats now because this yes. is a million cat challenge going home webinar and show us the beautiful picture. Gorgeous. I All right. Already. So, and one thing I wanted to note is that Adoptimize doesn't replace your amazing volunteers if you have them. Um, what it is, is it's a stop gap. It gets good photos online fast, and then volunteers can come and replace the photos on the weekends when they come and volunteer. But this is ba it's basically a tool for shelters to get these photos online a lot faster with much higher quality. So I'm actually going to show you the pictures that I'm going to up the sh demo this with. Okay. Oops, wrong one. All right. Um, we'll take a look at this one. Blackie. He's in a kennel, and it's a black cat. <laughs> Uh, so we actually offer two services. Um, this is our, our service for fosters. It's free um, for foster programs and the fosters. Basically, it's you upload your photo, we edit it for you, and then you can just um, send it to the shelter. We also offer an enterprise system for in-shelter use. So for a foster program, I'm just going to show you on the foster because it's pretty easy. So you put your name in, email. 
Um, we also, on our fosters, we don't have accounts because I find accounts pretty annoying um, when you are only going to use this one, once or twice. Um, let's see. Million cat challenge. And then we'll name our cat Black, Blackie the Black Cat. Very creative. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, we just got to make sure there's no people in it. Um, and there's only one pet. And then you tell us we're uploading a cat. And we're going to grab him. This one. Submit. Oh, all right. I didn't do that right. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. It is. You can just go back. You didn't ruin anything. You just go back. Yes. All right. So now we have emailed you the link to your pets page. Pretty fast. Come up here. And at this point, we start processing your image. So we're analyzing the, to find the cat picture. Um, and it takes maximum 30 seconds, but recently it's been taking closer to five to 10. Oh my gosh, look at that cat fitting under the door. That's right. We, we show you some uh, entertaining cat <laughs> gifts while you upload. Ta-da! Oh my gosh, look at that. It's gorgeous. Yeah, and I mean, it's really, it's, that's it. Like, it's that simple because it doesn't need to be, no one needs to be doing more, more crap in the shelter. Like, in, it, the intake photo is just one part of intake. And it makes like a regular picture into a, like a portrait. A yes. true portrait. It's really beautiful. Jessica. Thank you. Love it. Yeah, All you right. can always put it on a different color, but that's it. And okay. obviously this works for dogs too. Look at that. Oh my gosh. I don't know what, I think I like the purple one, the deep, the deep yeah. blue purple one. Good. Um, awesome. So we are grateful for you. Anything else you want to add? Um, let's see. Uh, so we are, uh, we have a new program actually. Uh, we started a couple weeks ago. Um, it's called our policy advisor program in which we are offering um, Adoptimize free to shelters. A policy advisor is going to be paying for Adoptimize to be in shelters, which I'm so excited about. Um, and we have a wait list. So if you are interested in joining it, um, I'll drop my email in the chat and you can just reach out. Awesome. Great, Jessica. Thank you so much. Great job. It's a beautiful program, or you call it is an algorithm. Is that the lingo I'm supposed to use? Yeah, yeah I guess it's, it's AI based, but no one really cares about that as long as it's, it's saving lives. I don't care what it's called. I love it. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for doing thank the cat so from the Million Cat Challenge. Thank you so much. And next up is Arter Sosa from Outer Pets and how you got started. Of course. Well, nice to meet you, uh, everyone, actually. Nice to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur. Um, I started Auto Pets a few years ago, and the intention was to facilitate the adoption process and the bureaucracy that is naturally part of the process, right? When we think about contract um, signing and the adoption fee and all of these little steps that when we look into the volume of our shelters do accumulate in a really a uh, big portion of time that is dedicated to the process rather than the animals. Right, which so, you your wife experienced, right? So this is how you started because you and your wife were adopting and you thought there's a better way, right? Yeah, but at the time we did to help the rescue that, that we had adopted from and we wanted to help and then um, other people were asking about it and they were like, well, maybe we could do something for more people. Um, and then over time, of course, it evolved and it changed quite a bit. Interestingly enough, over the past year in 2019 and forward, we were a little bit more focused on the uh, in-person adoption uh, part of the process, but we were born on the online and remote adoptions context, and then COVID just pushed us right back into that, uh, um, which has, it just has been incredibly interesting. And of course, because of partners like Dallas Animal Services, San Diego Humane, and there are so many great people behind this to really make sure that we are adapting and evolving with the new normal that it hasn't been settled yet. We're still figuring out what it looks like. Exactly. And we heard April talk about the numbers and you know firsthand, like shelters are overwhelmed with the number of applications or people who want to adopt. So we wanted you to be on today to talk about 
your program that helps shelters be more efficient, helping people who want to adopt. So that, that was one of our goals, and so we're glad you're here. I really appreciate being here as well. And I'm going to share my screen uh, briefly with everyone. So just for a quick context here, the platform will help the shelter staff manage the adoption process itself from the um, applications that are coming through um, from the adopters to uh, processing approvals, sending contracts for signature, collecting the uh, payment of the adoption fee, confirming that, facilitating the scheduling and the um, communications with the adopter as well through a feature that we call Smart Responses, which notifies the, the um, adopter every step of the way. And we it do, orders my dinner, yeah. too? Um, not yet, but that's probably <laughs> scheduled for December. <laughs> Uh, but we, we, do, we do integrate with the shelter software, um, of course. So right now, we do work with, um, um, you know, from shelter manager to chameleon or a pet points and um, shelter buddy. Different shelter softwares have different level of integrations with the system. So as an example, um, for shelter buddy clients, we actually do the entire adoption process, including the outcome of the animal, the creation of the person's uh, um, um, ID in the system, receipt, and everything everything um, in between. Um, and for other systems, it works um, in different ways, but all with the same core and purpose. Um, and I don't want to take a lot of our time here, but just to give you a, a preview of what it is, we import all of the animals, the adaptable animals, from your shelter software. You will be setting the rules on how that works, what kind of animals are you going to be importing, what is the frequency of it. And uh, we also create different locations if you decide to do so for uh, animals in foster versus animals in the shelter. So you can set different processes for someone that is applying for a foster animal versus someone that is applying for an animal that is in shelter. Or they could be in an off-site, like a PetSmart store or something. Could be anywhere. You create all your settings. Yes, essentially. So we import all the animals. And the adoption menu is really where we, we use to guide our work here. I, of course, to save us time, I submitted an application to Sapphire just before uh, we started the conversation. Sure. Um, the adopter will have a full preview of what is going to happen in this process. They will be notified by email at every step of what is it that they need to do next. Um, they will, of course, find the animals through your own website. I have here an example with an Adaptomize client. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh nice which is, plug, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> which is Palm Valley and on display on their website. Our friends at Dallas Animal Sh uh, Services. Um, there is another one here, the uh, SPCA Nevada. I just love the background color that they have on the website. We built an iframe that really fits in nicely with uh, yeah. whichever design you use on your website. People will find the animals. They will submit an, an application to adopt. All of this is customizable. So the questions that you have on your application, if you have an open um, adoption process or if you have a little bit more of a complex questionnaire, you will customize that to fit in with how you operate. Once you have their application, you simply start to reveal it. I see here that Arthur submitted an application about 42 minutes ago. I also see that Arthur adopted Coastal from us and Knox, and I see that they already paid for Gambit's adoption fee. So I decided that, well, he just wants one more. <laughs> uh, once we start the process, we will be basically looking at the application and you will be approving as you move forward in the process. Let's say um, as soon as you... Um, Start the review, you had an, an instruction for the adopter. I'm just going to put my email here quickly that you tell them about what is next step. Some shelters will have here a scheduling link that is, you know, let's get on a, on a, on a counseling call with our adoption and team and whichever step you would have in your shelter. And it would proceed with the process here. They would receive the contract. Uh, once they are ready to go for the adoption, they sign the contract, they pay the adoption fee. We have a donation feature as part of that as well that goes straight to the shelter. Right now, we have about 52% of all adoptions happening in the system include a donation to the shelter as well, which is really awesome. Um, and bottom line, faster process, no paperwork. We have kennel cards with uh, QR codes in them. So when people are at the shelter, they literally point their cameras at it and they get right into the online process uh, um, just as much as they would if they were home. Um, and trying well, here to- question. So yeah. they do that and there's like already a hold on the pet or, I mean, I guess it depends how the shelter operates. It will tell you right then. 
Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And there are things like, you know, if, uh, if an animal is approved to someone else and there were special in times like this that we have so many applications coming in and you approved an animal to someone, there is still a payment of the adoption fee and the contract that has to be signed. So it's not really confirmed yet, but it's getting there. Um, everyone else that had applied to that pet will has see, receive an email that you will customize, but it will let them know that that pet is almost adopted. So they know where they stand in the process there. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. And it just takes all the labor from the, the staff can then concentrate on making the right match and the counseling and all of that. That's amazing. That's a goal. And, and that's really what we, we um, aim to do. And also offering a, an experience that it's easy to use, that is design customer driven uh, uh, for the shelters to really guide. And again, I need to thank, um, you no know, cat adoption team, Karen, that we'll be speaking later, another partner of ours is just um, the work that they do and Dallas Animal Services, just helping shape what is the future of adoption for us. It's just um, invaluable. Yes. Well, anybody who knows me knows I'm not an IT person. Um, this is so impressive. I think even an IT person would be impressed. But we want everybody to know about these tools to help them work more efficiently and free up their time because everyone is strapped and everyone is buried in work and so many animals coming in the shelter. So this is really, um, I think, so helpful. And we, um, did you want to add anything else before we bring Whitney and Rachel on? No, I think that's pretty much it. Just a <laughs> quick spell <laughs> about it. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to ask Whitney Hansen and Rachel Williams from Dallas Animal Services in Dallas, Texas, um, to talk about their experiences. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Using it at pets. How long have you guys been using it? We've been using it. We closed in March 2020, so we've been using it pretty much since April um, of 2020. Um, and we had already had the ball rolling because we won the innovation reward. So we had already nice. anticipated this. Yeah, yeah, but it, it just totally changed um, when COVID hit. We had to figure out a way to get our pets adopted fast as possible <laughs> um, without having people inside of our building. So um, Adipets was super flexible, got a lot of stuff done in a very short amount of time. And we were able to adopt out, um, I think over 6,000 pets since uh, April. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've been closed the entire time. So that means we have no adopters in, the, in our building. Wow. Oh my gosh. Whitney, anything <laughs> you want to add to that? That's amazing. And welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It is amazing. And I want to um, kind of echo what Ray said about how flexible Adipets has been. We did win the Petco Innovation Showdown. And so we were working with them already on um, our Dallas 90 shelter service system, but we no one planned for COVID. So we were not planning some of the things that we're using now. We weren't really planning to do those, some of them ever, but some of them were going to be in the last phase of the project in like 2021. So uh, Arthur and his team really worked with us to uh, kind of reprioritize and respond to what we really needed in that moment. And they, they responded almost instantly to any question or issue that we've had as we we tend to move very quickly and um we uh our we need our partners to move quickly with us and they've Absolutely. definitely and, done that right Whitney share with everybody how many your total overall intake like from last year I mean this year is crazy but which are so for 2019 we brought in almost 39,000 dogs and cats yeah. And that was a record for us, but we had, I think the year before it was around 36,000. So it was a growth, but it wasn't a huge change. Um, we get in, and during 2019, we got in about, on average, about 700 animals a week. So, you know, it moved, we needed something to move fast with us and you know, our capacity right now is lower. I think a lot of the shelters are experiencing that, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but, you know, this has really helped us to make sure that we are staying um, 
in a good length of stay area, we're staying within our capacity for care, we're matching these animals with great homes, and that our staff can keep organized and respond to all the inquiries that we're getting every day. Yeah, that's awesome. And what we wanted to do today was profile shelters of all sizes. So you're the biggest. And then we have other organizations that have obviously a much lower intake um, so that everybody can get something out of it. But I think it's a true testament to Adipets to such you're such a giant organization. It's like changing one policy or program is like moving the Titanic and so or moving a big ship. That's a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I think that's a, that's a testament to um, the program, and I'm so happy. Anything else, Rachel, you want to add? Yeah, I actually need to make a correction. We've done 2,359 adoptions since we've, since we've started. Um, we did see a change as far as, like, animals being returned. So from, compared to last year, we saw probably about an 18% return rate for adoptions. And then in 2020, we're down to a 6%. So what it's telling us is even though we're doing a smaller amounts of adoptions, we have better quality adoptions. Those people are keeping those pets in those homes after adoption. An unexpected um, win was we have an increase in the total amount of dogs that are heart lung positive being adopted. So that is one of the things that I was not expecting at all, didn't even put on my radar, but we, do, we have seen um, a, a huge increase of, of dogs that are heart lung positive adopted. That's so great, Rachel. And, and it's interesting that your returns went down. And do you think that's because you have this much more efficient way and your staff and adoption counselors have more time for adopters? Is that what you correlate it to? I think so. We, we're spending more time with, more time with adopters now than we've ever done before. Um, so, you know, in, in addition to having Adipets, we had a acuity, like a scheduling system set up. So we are taking 20 minutes with every person to talk about what their expectations with the pet and making sure that we, we have more successful matches. Um, so I think it's a conjunction of a lot of different pieces put together, but Adipets has really made it possible for us to to manage our applications, you know, manage yeah. what the people are in. Because we have a system to manage the pets, but we did never have a, a system to manage applications. Exactly, right. Whitney, any right. comments? Yeah, I just wanted Ray to um, also touch on the improvement in the quality of, um, of the, app, not of the applications, but actual following through. When we first went and had COVID uh, responses set up, we were using a different, we were kind of throwing things together to do virtual adoptions. And um, so the percentage of people that made appointments what, and that actually adopted was actually pretty low. And once we switched into Adipets, it went up substantially. Do you remember what those numbers were, Ray? I think um, in, I think the last time I looked at it was in July and we had a, like over 60% of the people who made appointments adopted a pet. And we've seen a gradual increase of that every, because the system is better, the animals that are not available for adoption are not seen. You know, you only, and Adipets made it super easy to, to basically put the animals that I have the least amount of interaction online are at the top of our web page um, and the animals that have the most interaction or the most applications are at the bottom so we're seeing more of our long stays um, and less adoptable dogs are, are, are getting a lot more attention than they used to and we now can quantify who's here who's getting adopted who's not getting adopted and trying to figure out programs to push those animals that are struggling which I love that. I love that your long-termers are, they're highlighted where they should be, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that extra advocacy. That's amazing. Yeah, because we need say. help with those animals. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Arthur, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I was just getting a little shy <laughs> with the compliments. Is But the, the <laughs> Dallas Animal Services team, I got to give it to them that for a shelter of that size, with the team that they have, which are, huge team and um it's still actually not enough for how much they do to be right. fair uh, right. but they have been so incredible to work with because this future that we're talking here is not predefined we are building as we're going and we're literally building the ship 
as we are sailing in it. Um, and the team is incredibly responsive. And they are, in my opinion, visionaries. They are looking at not just at what we're struggling with right now as a society, but where are we going to be later? And we're already building towards that path. Uh, and without the Dallas Animal Services team, uh, um, quite frankly, uh, a lot of the learnings that we've had together in this past few months wouldn't be a reality. And it's, it's um, more than uh, important. They are essential to what is being done here. Yeah, well, kudos to you all. And the Million Cat Challenge, thanks you. We're going to send you each a litter of kittens that will um, <laughs> be delivered tomorrow morning. So thank you. <laughs> thanks for coming on, you guys. We appreciate it. I'm going to ask the Pensacola Humane Society to come on, Dara Flanagan, and I'm not sure if Ali Martinez lost her internet. I saw some note about that. Oh, there she is. <laughs> I'm here. Yay. All right. And Dara, there you are. Hi. So before we get started um, on the adoption piece, what is most near and dear to my part, heart, and when people ask me about adoptions or long-term animals in the shelter, I'm like, don't talk to me about long-termers until you talk to me about your safety net program. So Dara, why don't we start there with just, um, it brings like tears to my eyes, I'm not even kidding. Like, tell us a little bit about the health team, when that started, and, and how it's really enabled you all to do what you're doing now. Sure. Well, you know, in we've been working on this pretty much since you came to see us, I think it was in 2017, um, and basically changed the whole way we did everything, and we're forever grateful to you and awesome. every the shelter assessment team and everything that you guys did for us. But um, we so for a long time, we had been working in the direction of building this really strong safety net, and our whole goal is to become our community's first resource instead of their last resort and to help our municipal shelters around us that have very high kill rates and very low live release rates um, to manage that and do what we could as a nonprofit to kind of take some of that burden off of them. So we were working and we were working and you know, you're always putting out a fire here, putting out a fire there. Well, COVID struck and we didn't have any choice but to be, have a safety net, right? Because we shut down and that was it. And so for about the first 45 to 50 days of COVID, I was our only person that was communicating with the public and the outside world. So I was basically doing intake diversion 12 hours a day for about a month straight. Yeah. And, and I love the name. It's the help team. Uh, it, I love it. It's the best yeah, name. And, and so the help team was born and we we're very lucky at the Humane Society to have an incredible executive director yes. and Jennifer Bittner, who is so forward thinking and so open and ready to jump on whatever is happening that's working. Um, and she always says yes to anything that's innovative and new and a board of directors that has our back. It took a long time to get us there, but we're very lucky that we're there now. We're very lucky. And you gave me a couple of statistics um, about your help team um, just tell us a little bit about the impact from whatever time. So, so starting on May 14th is when the actual team was put together and we started tracking our data. Um, and since then, we have helped over 1,600 ant cats and dogs, over 600 families that had those 1,600 cats and dogs. We have completely diverted a, almost 1,100 of those animals, meaning that they were able to either stay in the home or they were able to be rehomed through um, adopt a pet, which we use for oh a lot God. of different things. Yeah, we're all connected, yes. are we not? Yeah, we're all connected. And um, some other resources, um, we have done about 120 TNRs. Um, only 42 animals out of the 1,600 have ended up at one of our municipal shelters. So we That's actually really have remarkable, and you're such. And I, what I didn't say is Pensacola Humane Society, you're in Pensacola, Florida in the Panhandle, you're a nonprofit, you're a smaller shelter, you handle usually about a thousand, right? Am I wrong? Yep. It's about a th between 1,000 and 1,100 noses in and noses out. Yeah. Right. So to those kind of numbers, Dara, are really, truly remarkable. So kudos to your help team, to you and everybody, yep. and of course, Jennifer, your volunteers, yeah. the board, I can go on and on. Oh, yeah. Well, but um, even a couple of years ago, you really started to transfer to an open adoption concept. So that was pre-COVID. So talk about that. That was not an easy transition for your organization. 
It really wasn't. So like we were saying, 2018 is about the time we made the commitment to become more of a resource center and less of a drop your dogs off dumping ground, right? Yeah. Um, so that meant doing a really deep dive into our philosophies and practices. And what we found was that many of them were inherently racist. They were inherently classist and ageist. Um, and so because we have such great support from our board and our executive director is like the spearhead of all of this being on the forefront of everything. Um, in the course of about a week, we threw out everything we had done for the last 75 years, because we've been around <laughs> since 1943, um, and implemented the adopters welcome philosophy. And it was a really difficult transition. There's no question about that. Um, we lost quite a few staff members. All of our supervisors left immediately. Um, we lost all of, we lost a fair number of volunteers but the community really rallied behind us and um, our reputation in the community and our staff morale skyrocketed. Um, we went from an invasive four page, very, uh, and when I say invasive, it was unbelievably invasive. Um, four pages of very tiny font. We threw that away. We dog on to, it's a page and a half, but that's because the font is large enough for our elderly clients to be able to read it. Um, and it's just basic questions. It's very much just who you are, what pets do you have, and how, yeah. you know, do you believe in declawing? That's basically so what we proud. ask. So proud of you all. And so then COVID hit, and boy, did you have to pivot everything. So talk about that. You got the health team going. You started doing that work. Yeah, I was the help team. Yeah, you were the original help team. Yeah, so we knew the governor would have to do a statewide shutdown. Um, so because we're in Florida, we were last. We got to watch everybody go before us. Um, so we'd been strategizing for about 10 to 14 days before he announced the shutdown. Um, so 10 to 14 days before COVID, we ceased our owner surrenders. Um, we ceased intake and transfers to try to minimize the number of dogs and cats in our care. And then when the announcement came on April 2nd that we had 24 hours until everything shut down, we immediately went live on Facebook um, to let the community know that all the adoption fees were waived. We do that quite often. Um, we were in need of emergency fosters to help us get all the animals out of the shelter within the next 24 hours. And then we did additional posts with, um, with live, live adoptions happening, live foster pickups. Um, come on down right now. Look at this cat. It needs a home. Um, and within the first four hours of the live post that um, I did, we had foster families for every single animal in our shelter. And we were calling in volunteers to help um, the next day to do shelter tours and adoptions because it had been shared uh, like 700 times um, in our small 55,000 population city. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and so then when we left, after we closed that day, the foster families came in to pick up their quarantine between buddies. But what was great is that in 24 hours, we had adopted out every single available cat and all but nine available dogs. Um, wow. And then in the last hour, they went into foster care. So on March 31st, we had 42 animals in custody, which is half of our capacity, because remember, we had already been rocking and rolling on adoptions and had basically ceased intake 14 days before the shutdown. And then on April 3rd, we had 23 animals um, under our care. and but only nine of those were ado available for adoption. Most of them were kittens because it had started to be kitten season. Wow, and Allie, now like all these animals are in foster. I mean, is your goal to get them into their adoptive home right from foster? Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, that's pretty ideal to get them straight into foster homes from the moment they're, um, they have an intake appointment and then straight to their adoptive home from their foster home. We, if we can, keep them out of the shelter entirely that's what we try and do yeah and so how are you handling or how are your fosters handling what are they using to communicate with adopters are they using facetime or zoom or are they meeting in person um most of them are choosing to meet in person um you know respecting the social distancing and everything they have the option to just communicate via email or text messaging and exchange photos and zoom if they want but it seems like most of them choose to meet in person and um and they're able to do the, an entire adoption right then and there that moment so it's, yeah. it's been really nice and what kinds of things have you used like technology wise like maddie's pet assistant like because it, it, you went from 
a, you know, a few animals in foster to like everybody in foster, right? That wasn't adopted. Uh, we use Mad Maddie's pet assistant. Yes, it's been really great. Um, it helps be the middleman in between us and the fosters with getting information, um, just creating a line for them so they feel supported and are having questions asked and answered for them. And um, along with Maddie's pet assistant, we use um, our Trello board, which has been really great. Um, and at foster what needs fostering in case somebody is thinking about fostering but hasn't quite taken the plunge yet and then they choose to by seeing all these cute faces that need help. Um, and then our Facebook page, of course, too. Awesome. So what, Derek, there's three things um, that you could you say, like, we have these three tips for shelters that are just like, oh, my gosh, we're bare, we don't know what to do. We're still at ground zero or it's still really hard. Um, what three things bubble up as big lessons for you during all of this? Um, one of the things is just start. You know, you think you can't start, but you already have volunteers. You already have, um, you already have the people that answer your phones. You already have the people that are doing intakes. You already have the people who are doing adoptions. They're already there. You just have They're to um, adjust the dialogue that you're having and the conversations that the staff that already exist have with people in order to move to a more foster centric model, in order to move to a more, um, intake diversion safety net um, existence as a resource center. Um, and the, one of the other things that I really love saying is help is only help if it helps. So we can't expect people to come to us if all we're going to do is they come to us with a problem and all we're going to do is lecture them over what they need to be doing or what they should have been doing. Um, we need to have options for them. We need to have solutions for them um, that are actually going to help them in their situation. So even if you don't have, if you're not able to help that situation, you need to be able to point people in the direction of the places that can help them, you know, so that even, if, you know, if it's on your website or if you just have like a link to here's the housing help people or whatever it is that you right. can't offer yourself, make sure that you can point people in the right direction. Um, and then I think a lot of it has to do with um, trusting the people that you work with you know, to make good decisions and, in, and enable your staff and empower them to make the right decisions for the animals under your care. And then they'll take a lot more pride and ownership in everything that happens within your walls and within yeah. your foster programs. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was actually going to say something very similar to you, but I think we all agree um, this movement, and it sounds like you all are committed, right, Allie, to like this, you love working like this, and it's better for the animals, and it's better for the public to be a more foster-centric, community-centric organization, right? And so the Human Animal Support Services um, group that's been started by American Pets Alive and supported by Maddie's as well, and all of us at Million Cat are part of it too, um, is just that, and all falls in line with the Best Practice Playbook. So if you haven't read the Best Practice Playbook for Animal Shelters, please order your copy on Amazon. That's my commercial. Um, just to say, this is the way, this is what we've been trying to get everybody in animal welfare to do so COVID jump started us and you guys are a testament to it's working and it's working it's better working. not just for pets but for people right right Absolutely. For your staff, everything has gotten better for your our staff, reviews are better yeah there are people happier uh, everyone is happier uh, we're happier the clients are happier the animals are winning every time we turn around yes amazing. and because if i could just add one little quick thing because the animals, so many of our animals are in foster, the ones that are more challenging that may not fit into a foster home and remain at the shelter are getting adopted. Yeah. Right? So yeah. instead of staying for 60 days, they're staying for 14 days. Yeah. Amazing. Right. Just what I want to hear for sure. Allie, any parting comments? I do want to add that everybody should send everything out to foster. Um, a lot of shelters, I know that they can hold on to their strays with a stray hold and medical assessments and stuff like that. But there are fosters out there that will help with all of that. They, you know, they like the challenging ones and they will hold them for their stray hold. And, and if nobody comes forward, then they're available for adoption while being in a home. And if they're claimed, then great. They go from the foster home to their, back to their home. And exactly. I think everybody should look into that too. 
Well, thank you both for joining us. Allie and Dara will be here for questions, but thank you so much, Pensacola Humane Society. We're so proud of you. Our next guest is Karen Green from the cat adoption team in Portland, Oregon. But Karen couldn't make it live, so we pre-recorded her interview. So that's about 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and answer questions and close out the Million Cat Royal Canaan Maddie's webinar series. So take a listen to Karen Green from the cat adoption team. Hi, Karen. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. So I know 2020 is a crazy year, but last year you handled somewhere around 3,600 cats, right? And kittens, mm -hmm. of course, when we say cats. And then when COVID hit, just like a lot of shelters, you had to pivot. Um, so tell us about what happened starting maybe in March. Yeah, what so we... <laughs> So many things changed. Uh, but, uh, in terms of our um, in our adoption program, we we briefly um, ran with adoptions by appointment, but pretty quickly when our state went into shelter in place orders, we shifted. We um, shut down for a brief period of time to completely rebuild our adoption program and moved to a virtual adoption um, process. And we've actually been running all of our adoptions that way since then. Um, so our doors are actually not open um, still and all of our adoptions are virtual now. Interesting, Karen, because a lot of people are concerned, right? That who's gonna adopt virtually? I would never adopt a cat or dog just looking at a video or talking so, but it's worked really well for you. So talk about that. It has, and I know it seems strange. You know, one of our requirements used to be, we really wanted people to meet the animals in person. I think sure. one of the things that's funny is that, you know, people don't actually get a really accurate picture of what uh, a pet is like. Um, and I think that can be especially the case with cats by meeting them in a shelter environment. Um, and, and it's just not something that's really workable uh, these days. So uh, the demand for adoption is still really high right now. And we have seen our adoptions, you know, it took us a while to get things rolling again, but we're, we're doing about um, in August, about 85% of our normal level of adoptions, which is, this is one of our busiest times of the year right now. So um, I think last week we did, uh, eight, you know, 83 adoptions. And normally we would have uh, the same week last year we we did 90. So that's a pretty pretty close so to right up uh, there. Yeah. yeah. And you said something interesting, right? When you meet cats in shelters, they're not really their true selves anyway, right? So they're really not. that's really interesting. I'm gonna have to keep that in mind. This is a major shift for your staff. Like what kinds of things did you change with your staff when so you we said it said virtual? Yeah, we actually reconfigured some of several of our roles um, pretty pretty completely. So some of the jobs we have a remote adoption coordinator position now, um, where we have uh, a couple of our staff who just receive those um, adoption kind of applications and process those and just organize where people are. Um, well, really, where the cats are in the different stages of the adoption process. So we took on three new software programs that we have our staff initially it was just staff of adoption counselors and now some of our volunteer adoption counselors as well using so just keeping track of where all the cats are in the process um, being adopted from either the shelter foster homes um, or our offsite adoption centers um, as getting scheduled, they're getting their uh, adoption counseling, they're getting picked up from those different locations. It's, uh, it's a lot to manage. Right, to keep everything in check. And so I'm assuming when they go to an offsite, they're already sterilized, but yeah. if they're in the shelter or foster care, maybe they have to come back for surgery, correct? Yes, yeah, so we're getting them and we get them altered as, as, as early in the process as possible. Um, and, and they're all um, spayed or neutered before they go to their adoptive homes. Um, but yes, sometimes they, they, they are going to foster care before they're, they're altered, yes. Got it. So, right. So you're still doing a blend. Really, you have three different places. Your felines could be in an offsite adoption venue, in a foster home, or in the shelter. 
Yeah. So, and does that kind of ebb and flow numbers wise? Yeah, we actually just resumed adoptions from our offsite adoption centers a few weeks ago, but we've been using foster homes and, and the shelter now, you know, since, since April and adopters are doing curbside pickup from, um, from either of those locations. Right, right. And you mentioned technology, new technology. Coincidentally, we talked to, you heard about Adopets today, everybody who's listening, right? And so you all were um, thinking about that before, but then you took the leap, right? So yeah. talk about Adopets, and it's just a coincidence. I didn't even know that you used that program when we first started talking. So talk about your experience and how that's helped you. Yeah, so we were a pretty early adopter with Adipets, and it's been, you know, I think we've been we've been growing with them with our virtual adoption program. It's really helpful that it um, that they sync with Shelter Buddy, or which is our shelter software. So um, those adopter application um, information, the adopter agreements, all that information just goes directly into our shelter software. So all of the things. Yeah, it is a, it's a huge help. So we're using um, Adipets people, you know, when they see um, our cats and kittens available for adoption on our website, they can just click on uh, on one of those cats and say, I want to adopt this cat and they fill out the application right there. Um, we call them adoption profiles, but um, it serves the same kind of purpose. And that comes into us. And then if, you know, when we approve that and process that, it just goes directly into the shelter buddy file. So we used to be hands entering that. <laughs> yeah. So it's been working through a lot, but we use that. We use Acuity for scheduling, um, uh, scheduling pickups and scheduling our Zoom adoption counseling appointments, and we're using Zoom for adoption counseling. Awesome. You know, we had a conversation today with our UF team about those virtual meet and greets with, with fosters, for example. So how are your fosters kind of suddenly into this? Are they doing Zoom? Are they doing in person? Or again, is that a blend? So for meet and greets, the fosters actually determine on their own if and how they're going to do meet and greets right. with people. A lot of our adopters don't do meet and greets, so they're they're um, either by phone or um, or back and forth with email or um, with with the remote adoption counselors, uh, coordinators, getting more information about the pet that they're interested yeah. in. Um, if that pet is in foster care, then they will be in touch directly with the foster parent. And in that case, then they might coordinate with really whatever technology the foster parent prefers and has access to and will coordinate with the potential right. adopter. So it could be FaceTime or Microsoft Teams or Zoom. And what are you using to schedule appointments? We use Acuity. Okay. Um, which we found to be really helpful. Very popular with shelters popular. today, right? Yeah. Awesome. And you like that? Yeah, we use that actually. We use it at our thrift store as well. When we initially, when we reopened our, th uh, our thrift store, we, we opened it just by appointment and we ended up using Acuity for that as well. So. Oh, a thrift store appointment. I love thrift stores. Yeah. I was just in our pet project thrift store. Shout out to the pet project in Broward County. They have a great thrift store. I just got two cat carriers there the other day. Oh, nice. You have to come visit ours if you're ever in our area. Yes, when, I, when I'm in Portland next time, I absolutely will. Um, you know, I have, I think like all of us, I have evolved in my own philosophies and way back when I thought, boy, we better be charging a high adoption fee so we make sure people are serious. But fast forward to 2015 when I read Adopters Welcome and I was blown away that there is no correlation. Also, my disclaimer, Karen, is I work with a lot of shelters euthanizing a lot of animals. So I know Portland and in particular your organization, I mean, you haven't euthanized your area as a very, the Northwest United States, a very mature with respect to animal welfare. And so in our conversation with you, I also had to take a step back and wait a minute, we might need to evolve again. So um, talk about how you are determining that adoption fee. You told me that happens on intake. We do. So we have a fast track scoring system that we use to uh, 
really to determine with our cats when they come in what kind of housing and extra care they might need while they're with us. And another thing that we use that score for is to determine their adoption fee. So the fast tracking system helps us kind of evaluate, you know, what, um, how, how, how quickly this cat's likely to go through our system. So uh, a fast track, cats come through that, they get a score, uh, end up with a score, and they might either be fast track, medium track, slow track, or extraordinary adopter candidate track. Um, Whoa, and, I heard that. Extraordinary <laughs> adopter candidate track. So a fast track cat is a cat that basically, you know, we're going to spay or neuter them, put, you know, give them their preventive care. And if we put this cat in front of adopters, they're, they're going to get adopted pretty much. They're going to get themselves adopted pretty quickly. Um, they don't need a lot extra from us. And the, the slower track the cat is on, the more extra support they need from us. So that's really what that system is there for. And what's what we created it for. Um, a, a cat that's a, a slower track cat is going to get is going to get larger housing earlier on because we expect that that cat's going to be in our system longer. We also because that cat's going to need more help to get adopted, um, and is is we recognize is is probably in lower demand by adopters. We're going to give them a lower adoption fee. So that's where the correlation is with our adoption fee. So a fast track cat we know is in high demand. Um, we can you know, reclaim a little bit more of the funds that we put into our cats on those fast track cats. So our, you know, kittens, our young, healthy, fast, you know, fast track kittens, our adoption fees are actually about $200 for our kittens. Um, but I'm going to disgrace myself here. I'm I just going to evolve here, Karen. Um, and it's not because we, th we, we want people to prove that they're serious. It's just because we, it does help us kind of reclaim what, um, some of what we, we put into the cats um, in our care. Our slower track cats might be, you know, our $15. You know, we've got a, a 16 year old hyperthyroid heart murmur um, cat right now. He's, um, he was either $15 or, uh, you know, or free, right? He, he needs all the help getting through our, our, our system as possible. He'd also go home with medication and food and <laughs> all of the extra things that he can get. Right, right. And an internist. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's awesome. But I love that it's related to length of stay because my concern, I think, um, with a lot of my colleagues are it's going to increase the length of stay, but you're proving that it's the opposite. And that's why you're pricing them where you are because you know that they're going to get adopted within a day or two. Exactly. It sounds like. And Karen, we also talked about how this ties in to um, what we now recognize as the major issue in our country today is systemic inequity, right? So you shared with me that your board was having those conversations. So talk to me about that because uh, some family might not be able to afford the $200 adoption fee. And so how is your board grappling and dealing with that issue now? Right. I mean, those are really conversations we're having throughout our whole our whole organization. Yes. There's one thing that we that we hadn't really discussed or or made a priority of our adoption program was was how in inclusive it was. Um, we do have fee reduced um, or fee waived adoption promotions when we need to move. Um, move cats or kittens more quickly through our system. Um, typically our length of stay is, is very short and the thing that is, um, is holding cats or kittens up has nothing to do with their adoption fee. But there are times when, you know, we get to periods of the year or things like that when, when, when it would be helpful um, to, to move cats yeah. or kittens more quickly. Um, but but still, there are the good chunks of the year when if you want to adopt a kitten from us, they're going to be at least one hundred and fifty dollars and often two hundred. Yeah. So that that's not really accessible for for people who are low income. Um, and 
and that's not something that we've really looked at before. So that's that's a conversation that we're having now is really looking at our adoption program more with a lens of how do we make it more inclusive and, um, you know, our adoption program as well as all of our, our programs and services. I'm so grateful um, to your organization for that because, and for these conversations that are bringing all of these things right to our attention. So I really appreciate you all for looking at that. Is there any, any other parting comments you want to share with our audience today, Karen? Uh, I, I want to thank you again for having us. I think with the, um, those diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of considerations is something that we're all looking at. Um, and I think the more that we can be open to, to considering what our organizations are doing and how we could be doing things differently, um, I think is I encourage all of us to do that. Absolutely. I just want to mention a really quick thing on length of stay that you mentioned before. Our length of stay is, is quite a bit down um, over the past several months than it has been. We wondered with this new adoption process if it would be longer and it's been shorter. The demand for for pets is 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 so high right now you know and people still are, even now in august go, going into september amazing yeah but i'm uh, so glad to hear it yeah including those those you know the older special needs um yeah. you know the people are just so eager to bring more more love into their, a lot of their seasoned, lives. right here we call them seasoned <laughs> yeah <laughs> those cats with lots of life experience exactly <laughs> Well, thanks again to you and the cat adoption team. Thanks for joining oh, us today. Thanks so much for having me again. Have a great rest of your day. All right. So now we have some really exciting announcements. Um, as you know, our webinar series has been sponsored by Royal Canaan. They have an awesome shelter program, 25% off, but if you buy your first order, you get an additional 20% off with the code at the bottom, save 20. Um, so really amazing. We also want to thank Royal Canaan for their generosity supporting Portal Mania. As many of you know, we just bought thousands of portals for over 120 shelters and still counting. Um, Shoreline was a great partner. Shoreline is also doing 20% off portals right now. And we um, want to announce last week's winner. If you've been watching the webinar series, you know that every webinar, Royal Canaan is giving 50 of these cat to vet boxes. And this is amazing. So this is the fifth year that Royal Canaan has been doing this take your cat to the vet campaign there are 90 million pet cats in the United States and only half go to the vet, you guys. Isn't that unbelievable? Shocking statistics. So Royal Canaan is trying to change that. And in this box, you get a free veterinary visit at Banfield. You get, of course, a sample of the Royal Canaan food, my favorite feel-away spray, that fear-free pheromone. You even get a beautiful cat to vet t-shirt and this really amazing litter that um, when the cat has blood in the urine, it changes the color of the litter. So all that's in this box. So 50 of these boxes are being awarded. I need a drum roll, a virtual drum roll from everybody. The winner from last week is Callie Krugel from the Itty Bitty Kitty Rescue in San Jose, California. So congratulations to Callie. And we want to thank Maddie's for hosting and, and this platform and for Allison and everybody at Maddie's for their support. So thanks for watching this video, this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Have a great day and go out and adopt more cats and kittens. Thanks to our panelists and our guests today, too. Bye-bye.